Okay, well, welcome. Uh, welcome to this uh, workshop. Um, Workers' rights are human rights, diversing, diversifying labor strategies in a changing world. And I, I want to welcome uh, all of you here to what uh, promises to be, I think, a very stimulating and insightful workshop uh, on this particular issue, which I, I know has been one that's been uh, stimulating broader debate and interest uh, on a global scale, as well as, of course, here in the United States and in Canada as well. Um, I think, uh, first of all, I want to have some acknowledgments uh, for today's uh, workshop. The first is, I think, uh, we'd like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, the indigenous, indigenous people on whose ancestral lands we now stand. Okay, so that would be our first acknowledgement. Uh, we would also like to acknowledge the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs, the 10th Decade Project, which helped fund uh, much of today's workshop, and uh, we really appreciate that. We also got co-sponsorship and uh, funding from the Department of Anthropology, the Department of Geography, Department of History, Department of Political Science, uh, the Social Science PhD Program, uh, Women and Gender Studies, uh, Department of Sociology, and the Program uh, for the Advancement of Research and Conflict and Collaboration, uh, PARC. Um, I'd also really, really like to acknowledge and thank my co-organizers uh, co here today, um, Cecilia Green of the Department of Anthropology, uh, Stephen Parks of uh, Writing and Rhetoric, and, uh, and uh, also uh, introduce myself, Todd Rutherford from the Department of Geography. Um, and I'd especially like to thank uh, the great assistance of Deborah Toole of Park, uh, without whom we really couldn't have brought uh, together's event uh, at all. So I uh, really want to give a actually want to give a hand right now to Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> and I also want to thank Tom Fazio, who's handling all the IT in the back. So um, and it's a great setup for us here today. Um, just a couple of things before we begin. I uh, just want to talk a little bit about the workshop structure. Uh, one of the things I think that was really great was that the participants uh, got together, especially with Cecilia, before uh, the workshop to talk about, you know, what would be the best way of actually holding the workshop. Uh, and so it was uh, very democratic in that uh, all the participants and, and the organizers were able to get together. And I think that the structure is going to be, I think, a very stimulating one. So basically what's going to happen today is, uh, first of all, the four participants are going to introduce themselves. And then uh, what I'm going to do is uh, turn it over to you for a few minutes and ask some of you uh, who would like to participate uh, what would you like to get out of today's uh, workshop? What kinds of issues are important to you? Uh, what kind of things would you like to see the speakers discuss? Um, and so forth like that. So we'll talk about that for a couple of minutes. And then this will be followed by a, a 15 minute presentation by each of the speakers. And then after that, I'm going to initiate a, a, a wider discussion with some questions of my own and then turn it over to you in the audience uh, to, to complete today's workshop. So that's basically, in a nutshell, uh, the kinds of uh, the structure of today's uh, procedures. Um, the questions that we're going to be looking at, um, and uh, just to, to go over those, are in what ways might human rights approach <coughs> both subvert traditional labor solidarities and create new ones? In what ways does market-driven globalization both subvert domestic labor rights and create opportunities for new forms of labor struggle and solidarity? And thirdly and finally, how do race, gender, and other identities change debates around the relationship between labor and human rights? And so I'll also just uh, put up the, the, the speakers and then um, have them uh, all introduce themselves. So, uh, Joseph, could you go first of all? Sure, please? thank you. I'm extremely excited to be here. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for uh, inviting me. It's an incredible honor. I'm Joseph Cohen. I'm the executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union of West Virginia. I've been in that job for a month. Uh, <laughs> and for those who don't know, the ACLU is sort of the preeminent defender of individual civil liberties and civil rights uh, in our affiliates case in West Virginia. Um, and we you know, aim to expand uh, and protect uh, rights and extend them to groups that have traditionally been denied them. Um, but for the 12 years prior to uh, coming to the ACLU of West Virginia, I uh, was in the legal department of the United Electrical Radio and Machine Workers of America, more commonly referred to as UE. Last seven years, I was the union's general counsel. 
Uh, UE is known for its um, rank and file structure, its militancy, and it's, uh, it's generally considered the most progressive uh, labor union in the United States. Um, so that's mainly what I'm gonna be talking about. So, uh, and prior to that, I worked for a place called Florida Rural Legal Services where I did a little bit of both individual rights stuff representing poor people who are facing housing crises and collective rights uh, where I represented and organized public housing tenants associations. Welcome, Larcine. Good afternoon, my name is Larcine Taylor and like Joseph, I am extremely proud and honored to be a part of this panel uh, for several reasons. Um, I just retired in July, but I'm still in the struggle for when it comes to workers' rights. And also, I think I can bring something to this panel that the other three cannot, and that I am a rank and file frontline worker. I've been in the trenches with all this going on in, in North Carolina. And like I said, I'm honored to be a part of this. I'm past president, I just gave up my presidency in October the 8th, um, my time run out. But I'm still very active within the union itself. I'm a Moral Monday arrestee. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. That's what's going on in North Carolina, but I'm a proud arrestee of that. I belong to Black Workers for Justice, where I got the Self-Determination Award. I'm in a lot of stuff, because there's a lot of stuff wrong in North Carolina. So, you know, I try to do what I can do to make it better and uh, for workers, uh, basically workers in general, because this world is, is really in a mess. And again, I'm, I'm glad to be here and hope I can answer some questions or give you something to go forth with. Thank you. Thank you, Larcy. Susan. Um, my name is Susan Kang, and I'm an associate professor of political science at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, which is part of the City University of New York system. So I guess I'm the academic here on this panel, and I'm very pleased and humbled to be with such um, people with such experience and um, who've done so much for the uh, labor movement and for uh, struggles for justice. Um, and um, I am uh, the author of a book called, uh, what's the book called again? Uh, La labor Rights, no, Human Rights and Labor Solidarity. <laughs> um, and it's a book about uh, my research uh, about this topic as well, about workers using human rights and labor rights international law to bolster uh, their position when it came to their own struggles domestically. And um, it's, I'll talk a bit about that research later. Um, and I've also been involved in various union organizing struggles um, as well, um, both as a community member and as my as a, someone who labors as an academic. Um, so I, I first became in, introduced to UE when I was a graduate student myself at the University of Minnesota, and we attempted to organize a graduate workers union and failed, but we learned a lot and it was a wonderful experience. Um, I'm also currently an executive committee member for the uh, campus branch of my own union, which is a uh, PSC, uh, and that's an affiliate of the AFT, and I'm very proud to be a member of that as well. And I'm also very pleased to be here. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Todd, Cecilia, the organizers for the invite, and for everybody in the room, I really appreciate uh, getting the chance to come down to the United States at this uh, pretty historic moment in a couple of weeks from now. Um, I'm just curious, are there any Canadians in the room? One Canadian? Okay. The, the thing, you know, we're many similarities, but one of the things in, in Canada is people tend to take the front row seats. So, <laughs> so as I said, uh, I really am very happy to be here along with this esteemed panel. And uh, just on that political piece, you know, truth be told, I, I really do hope the deplorables um, in this country are cast back into their whinging fringes uh, on November the 8th. <clears throat> and so that uh, neither you nor the media nor the rest of the world has to endure your pain. But uh, that's with my bias out of the way, a little bit of my background. Just thought I'd share a couple of key words. Um, policy junkie. Uh, my kids have called me a professional protester when I've returned home from various organizing, various mass marches from uh, Seattle, um, Genoa, um, different places around the world. Uh, and I think they, at one time, I remember my kid, uh, Ella's kid said, you know, if you just dress better, maybe they'd listen to you. <laughs> Pretty sure he's adopted. I've <laughs> uh, been a community organizer uh, in Canada, uh, but also in South Africa and India, Japan, and Brazil, to name a few places. A researcher and a writer. I have limited talent as a boxer, but I quite enjoy it. Uh, and I'm uh, an addicted do-it-yourselfer with uh, perhaps the longest running home renovation project in human history. 
professionally, I served as the National Director for Human Rights with the Canadian Labour Congress for eight years, two months, and 21 days. But who's counting? Uh, and I was the Education and Campaigns Director for the Polaris Institute, a uh, left-wing think shop and direct action campaign organization that targets uh, malfeasant corporations. Um, and most recently, I'm what's called an immigrant employment specialist helping newcomers crack into the labor market, which in fact means I try and find upbeat and cheery ways to tell people with multiple degrees that delivering pizza is an okay thing to do. <laughs> so speaking of ironic tensions, I really appreciate the questions that Todd had put up there. I brought a few practical examples uh, that I think will address those questions and hopefully will provoke a discussion in the whole room. So I look forward to doing that with all of you. Thank you, Carl. So uh, as I mentioned, what I'd like to do at this point is just turn things over to the audience for a little bit to get a sense of what you would like out of the uh, speakers today, what you would like out of discussion. So uh, would anybody like to uh, go, uh, go forth and um, ask some questions? Yeah, what would you like? Um, I'm faculty here at Syracuse University at the School of Information Studies. So. Uh, Considering where I'm coming from academically, uh, I am very interested about the impact of technology on labor rights, particularly because as more people begin to potentially be replaced by machines, uh, there is you know, some concern about you know, what will happen with the labor force, particularly those that are less protected. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Colin McKenzie. I'm also I'm a student here at Syracuse. I'd like to add on to that topic uh, in regards to globalization. Sure, Budweiser, for example, a few days ago talked uh, and actually introduced a self-driving 18-wheeler uh, here in the country. But in regards to China, there have been um, an increase in automated robotics. As we know, China uses, uh, in some cases, slave labor to try and produce the things that we here consume in the United States and they're moving towards automation already as it is, yet there is political rhetoric uh, from, I personally think in some cases from both sides, that talk about bringing jobs here home when I personally find that a little bit infeasible. I'm just wondering what your opinions might be on that topic since you have much more experience with this than I do. Anybody else would like to? Yeah. Um, my name is Jack Walker. I'm a member of Local 200 here in Syracuse. I have a question for you about organizing in a right-to-work state and how you maintain your your people once you do organize them. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good question. Yeah. It is extreme. Yeah, yeah. It is extremely okay. difficult to do, but we do it. We do it very well. Um, we don't have the right to collectively bargain, but we have managed to get some things passed, and it's called meet and confer. Uh, the only thing difference about that is that it's not legal and it's not binding. Uh, ever since I came in the union, which was 2001, that's been our goal, is to repeal that law that's on the books that, for, that forbids public employees for collectively bargain. And I feel like they fear it because once we, once we get that right, you're talking about power over the power. And that's what they're doing. That's why they're fighting so hard to, to deny us that right. But we are fighting to try to win that right. That's great, Marcy. Yes. I know this is an issue we're going to come back to. I think one more down back here. Yeah, I, um, my name is Andrew Habet. I'm a graduate student in the college. Uh, what am I doing? Oh, cultural composition and rhetoric. That's I just started. So, um, but in any case, I'm I'm from Belize, and I'm very curious as to how we can connect. Um, I guess union struggles across nation-state boundaries, because right now Belize is in like a really historical moment where the teachers' union was have been striking there nationally for the past two weeks, and. I don't know, it just seems like to me it felt monumentous in this way that I felt sort of insane for caring about this so much. And I know it's my home country, but it's just like, I care about the struggles that happen for Americans too, so where's the reciprocity here? That's great. Okay, so these are many points. Any other before we continue? Okay, thank you. So really great 
uh, points that, that um, I'm sure that we're going to discuss today. So, uh, well, without um, any further ado, we will uh, get into the, the main presentations. The order of the presentations will be uh, Joseph Cohn going first, then uh, Larsine Taylor, then uh, Susan Kang, and then Carl Flecker. So about 15 minutes uh, for each of the presentations. Thank you. And Larsine and I are going to double our time by working together and talking about the same things. We get 30 minutes, kind of, because we're, <laughs> we're a team. Um, what we're going to talk about is the struggle to attain uh, basic workers' rights in the state of North Carolina and our use of international human rights law as an integral part of a larger organizing campaign. But before we explain that, I just want to give a little overview, because there's probably people with lots of different uh, knowledge levels about labor law in the United States. So if you're not familiar, state and municipal workers, um, labor management relations are governed by state law. And there's a really wide range of state, state labor relations laws in the country. So you have states where there's really full collective bargaining rights, sort of mimicking the National Labor Relations Act, which governs private sectors employees. Then you have states where there's no collective bargaining law at all. And then you have North Carolina and you know very few other states that, as Larsine said, uh, affirmatively prohibit workers from engaging, from, from attaining collective bargaining agreements with their employers. The, there's a North Carolina law called North Carolina Statute uh, 9598, and it says that, you know, um, uh, public sector collective bargaining agreements are illegal, invalid, null and void against public policy, and they use like 10 other ways of saying you cannot do it. And we consider this to be um, this North Carolina General Statute 9598 to directly violate workers' fundamental human rights to freely associate and to collectively bargain. And these are basic human rights that are recognized in numerous international covenants. Um, and while we may feel this way, the United States federal court system does not. So in the late 60s and early 70s, there were a couple of uh, uh, federal district court cases that held that the prohibition on collective bargaining for public sector workers does not violate the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. And now Larsine and I and, and the workers in North Carolina think that that's crazy, uh, but that's the state of the law. Um, UE, the union that I work for and that Larsine is a member for, represents, there's UE Local 150 that represents public sector workers in North Carolina. Larsine was the president, she's a longtime member of that local. Um, <clears throat> Most of our members in UE Local 150 are African Americans, they're low wage workers, they're women. And um, these workers face substantial workplace injustices, uh, widespread race and sex discrimination, um, low, long hours, low wages, unsafe working conditions. All of these uh, abhorrent conditions are were fully explored and are outlined in a report by the um, ICLR, which stands for the uh, International Commission on Labor Rights. It's a New York-based NGO uh, made up of international human rights and labor rights experts from around the world. And in the, fo in the fall of 2005, the ICLR sent a delegation uh, of, of human rights experts from Sweden and South Africa, Nigeria, Canada, Mexico, a couple other countries, to North Carolina, and uh, Larson's going to talk about it, but they talked to the workers, they talked to employers, they met with legislators, and then they held a big hearing um, where people gave testimony. And at the end of it, um, the ICLR issued a report, and this report found all of these uh, significant, significant labor violations, um, and they determined, their final conclusion was that these, um, the, these labor law violations could largely have been uh, alleviated if workers had the right to collectively bargain. So <clears throat> at UE and the North Carolina International, Justice, uh, International Workers Justice Campaign, we spearheaded this movement to uh, have North Carolina General Statute 9598 repealed. Um, and since the federal courts had failed to act in the 70, 60s and 70s, you know, we decided to take other avenues. So we looked into sort of like international human rights standards. And there were basically, in my opinion, there are four main reasons that we were doing this. And it, one, it was to apply legal pressure on the legislature, okay? Um, if we could get a good ruling from the International Labor Organization or someone else, we could use that for pressure on the legislature. Two, we wanted to build coalitions with other progressive organizations um, 
to work towards overturning 95-98. And, and Larsen's gonna talk about this a lot because we were really, really sick, we've been really successful, like unbelievably successful in building these coalitions. Three, we wanted to focus the international spotlight on North Carolina. And four, we wanted, and most importantly, we wanted to organize grassroots support for overturning 95-98 and having it replaced with a legitimate collective bargaining framework. We used all, we used a lot of avenues, a lot of international mechanisms. And let me tell you, I'm no expert on international law, okay? I only know what I've done, which is, which is the stuff in North Carolina. But we used a lot of different international mechanisms, but the two main ones were we filed a complaint with the International Labor Organization, the ILO, which is an organ of the UN, um, and we got a really, really strong decision from the ILO, which is unusual. I'll talk about that in a minute. The second big thing we did, ILO complaint, second big thing we did is we filed submissions with uh, the Canadian and Mexican national administrative offices um, under what's, the North, what's called the North American Agreement on Labor Cooperation, the NALC, which is a side agreement that's supposed to, supposed to protect workers' rights in Canada, the United States, Mexico. It's a side agreement to NAFTA. Um, we did not have as much success with, with that. Um, but let me talk about the ILO decision first. So ultimately, the ILO gives us very powerful, strongly worded decision that called on North Carolina to repeal 95-98 and it um, told them to replace it with a, a legitimate collective bargaining framework through consultation with public sector unions. And that, that may not sound like the most amazing decision, but it actually is, because if you read ILO decisions, which I hadn't done until I, I filed this case, almost always all they say is that they're quote unquote expressing concern about something. So for them to come out and say, you're violating international law, over, repeal this law and replace it, it was kind of a, a big deal. And it's not a big deal. It's not like there's some ILO police force that's going to come and arrest the, you know, the governor of North Carolina for not fixing the, the human rights violations. But it is a big deal for a couple reasons. And one is we can now go to the North Carolina legislature and we can go to workers and we can go to the media and we can say North Carolina is in violation of international human rights standards. They're violating people's human rights. That's no longer in dispute. Um, and there's some power to that statement, right? Um, so that's the ILL decision. The NALC case, the, the NAFTA side agreement case, we wanted the same kind of things, but there, we, ha we thought that maybe we could get Canada and Mexico, Canada or Mexico, or both of them, to come to North Carolina and have their labor departments uh, do an investigation in the state. And we thought there could have been some real juice organiza organizationally from that, you know, especially if Mexico is coming to North Carolina to in investigate uh, uh, human rights and labor rights violations in our country. Um, and we kind of came up with this idea because when the, the ICLR was meeting, I said they were meeting with legislators when they were doing their investigation, uh, this is a very business friendly state, North Carolina, and a number of the legislators, when they met the uh, ICLR delegates from Canada and Mexico, said, oh, we don't want to make you mad, you're our two biggest trading partners. Mm -hmm. So as soon as they said that, everyone in the room was like, okay, I, I have an idea. So, so that's what we hope for. Unfortunately, so we tried to use this trade angle as, as to, you know, to build some organizational muscle. Unfortunately, neither Mexico nor Canada really took it seriously. Um, but they were still really good to file these submissions because one strong thing we got out of it is we were able to build these sort of like international coalitions and, and within the United States amongst the labor community. So when we filed the submissions, we had something like more, I think it was more than 50 US, Canadian, and Mexican trade unions join us, two global trade federations. And this was just another serious way to put pressure on the state of North Carolina. Um, you know, I really think we were able to get the international community, human rights and labor rights community, to focus their attention for one minute, at least on the state of North Carolina and the struggle of the workers there. And that's valuable of itself, but I think it's particularly valuable uh, for organizing workers, because these workers saw their fight not just as I'm fighting to improve my working conditions, but they saw it as a larger struggle for, um, uh, you know, a global struggle for the freedom to associate with other workers. And, it, you know, I, Larson will talk about this, but I, I think it's effective and powerful. Um, so like I said, there's no ILO policeman who's going to arrest the governor. So why, why did we think that sort of like international human rights was a good avenue to take um, rather than our tr sort of traditional, um, you know, uh, working class solidarity arguments for, for, for pe having people join labor unions. Um, 
Well, number one, we're organizing workers in the South. Um, there's not an established culture of trade unionism in North Carolina. Um, if people never have really had an association with the labor movement, if your parents or your grandparents or your friends or your neighbors, you don't know anyone who's ever been in a union, it's a really hard conversation to have with somebody as to why they should join a union. If they don't know what a union is, there's a lot of education that has to happen. And you know, particularly the workers that UE Local 150 represents, pr pr predominantly African American and low wage workers, these are people who have been, and women, these are people, groups have traditionally been excluded from much of the labor movement. So it's even, it's maybe even a tougher hurdle to overcome. Not just this is the South, but where, where there isn't a, a, a labor, uh, established labor culture. There's not an established union culture in these particular communities either. However, the workers we were organizing do have a significant history in the larger social justice movement. These are people who came out of the civil rights movement, came out of the anti-apartheid movement. They see the world in this, they naturally may not see it in, in labor you know, sort of terms of struggle, but they see it in terms of civil and human rights struggle. That They have a massive history in it. So the conversation is much easier, the initial conversation at least you're having with workers is much easier if you make it uh, relatable to them. Um, and it's a particularly easy conversation I think people found uh, in light, you know, organizing st state and municipal workers in the South. Um, I mean, Dr. King was killed organizing, I mean, supporting striking sanitation workers in Memphis. And that really resonates with people. And that's through the civil rights, human rights angle. So uh, that's kind of what the thinking was. And I think it's been pretty successful. We've organized pretty well, I think, in North Carolina, given all of the significant hurdles. Now, with that said, while that, uh, that's sort of like the initial angle people took, you know, worker education does not stop the minute you, someone signs a union card. So like the union goes and, you know, he, you know, heavily involved in educating workers on working class solidarity and traditional sort of the traditional collective uh, union framework. Um, it, it's the work, work, workers' rights or human rights is not mutually exclusive in any way from solidarity forever. I mean, they're not exclusive concepts in any way. Um, and the last thing I just wanna say before handing it over to my sister is that, you know, I, I, I'm not an academic, but they had sent me some papers on sort of the critiques of using this human rights um, framework. And one thing that struck me was, and, and I kind of understand where, where somebody theoretically would have a problem with this potentially, a trade unionist might have a, some concerns about it, but one thing that struck me is that our claims in this case, if you just think about what our claims were to the ILO and to the NALC, it was number one, that North Carolina was violating <coughs> Larsen's right to freely associate with other workers freedom of association, and number two, it was violating her right to be to work with other workers to collectively bargain with them. These are not really individual rights. It's, it, these are collective rights that we were um, arguing for. It's not that we're just taking the human rights and that's different than a sort of a traditional labor collective rights. We were trying to expand the notion of, in, of human rights to include these collective rights of freedom of association and to include this collective right of, you know, collective bargaining. So. That's all I'm going to say. I'm going to pass it off, and I'm really interested to hear what everyone else says and to continue the conversation. Thank you, brother. Um, first, I'd like to say that, like I say, I retired after 45 years. 21 years in the private sector and 24 years with the state of North Carolina. Um, and out of those years, it wasn't until the last 15 years that I even realized that I was in a right-to-work state. I had no idea. And that's because of the union, when the union come in, when UE came in and, and organized us. And since that time, it's been a battle and a struggle that I've suited myself for, and I'm gonna see it through till I, I no longer breathe. Um, and that's one thing that I, with UE, you know, they had the balls, the gospel, to come to the South, the unorganized South, and try to organize uh, public city, uh, public uh, employees. I think that was a smart thing for them to do because it was raiding going on at that time and stuff and they were losing members and stuff. And the only place for potential growth was the South. We've had unions to come down, you know, to, to try to organize before that I've learned since I've you know, gotten in a union, but they didn't stay. But UE is here to stay. 
there to stay, and I'm so proud to be a member of UE. Can't say that enough. We always say, who are we? UE. That's it. <laughs> okay. Uh, as I say, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a frontline worker, so I have to write my stuff down. You know, it's, but it's for the experiences. I can rattle off my head, but I wanted to address everything that the question calls for. So uh, labor rights as human rights and organizing uh, in the U.S. South. The first question, in what ways might human rights approaches both subvent traditional labor solidarities and create new ones? My local union, the North Carolina Public Service Workers Union, UE Local 150, is a affiliated state with, with the UE, the National Union. We feel that uplifting the labor rights as human rights has several benefits while recognizing weaknesses in the enforcement mechanism of labor rights as human rights. A major weakness in the human rights argument that reflects a shift from labor mobilizing the rank and file as the basis of labor power is the notion that power flows from flows right. But history shows that opposite is true. Rights, especially labor rights, flow from the power organized and mobilized by workers. We think this shift and notion for the U.S. national labor movement was one of the outcomes of the Reagan administration attack on the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization Union in 1981. What this weakness means from our experience in North Carolina is that most of the labor movement focuses on lobbying international, national, and state governmental bodies and supporting political candidates tied to the two main corporate controlled political parties. These activities don't engage the rank and file in ways that give organized labor the identity and focuses on transformative social movement. However, in the U.S. Southern region, there are major factors that make the labor rights as human rights approach an important part of strategy to build labor organizations and working class based power. Number one, trade union density is the lowest nationally. Anti-labor laws are the most concentrated. The divisions among the working class are the sharpest, rooted in a history of systematic race oppression against black people and white skin privileges for whites. National labor solidarity to organize the South has been almost non-existent since the late 1940s, Operation Dixie. The big unions, with few exceptions, have come south for short-term campaigns, mainly organized to make up for lost membership outside of the south, and not to organize the south as a strategic region of the U.S. and global economy. A regional framework has not yet matured for organizing a southern labor movement. The UE, in our work to organize in the south, saw labor rights as human rights, as a necessity approach to help draw attention to the need for international labor standards and international labor solidarity, because the U.S. South is a major region of the global economy. It is a major region with, for, with foreign direct investments from major multinational corporations in other developed countries, tied to the international bodies like the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, and International Monetary Fund that shape policies of the global economy. Our union understood that no single union alone could build enough pressure to make the ILO and the UN take stronger steps to make countries comply with labor standards, and that articulating labor rights as human rights raised the bar on why governments need to, hit, to be held accountable to labor standards. We also knew that our local union in North Carolina could not alone build an effective movement to repeal the ban on collective bargaining rights for public employees. That was one of the first states to make this right illegal. Following the passage of the, the Anti-Labor Taft-Hartley Act in 1949, it was the year I was born, I just realized that. <laughs> I must have been the reason for it, huh? <laughs> okay. And among the states uh, promoting the racist state rights movement, in the South to push for the inclusion of Section 14B right to work laws as part of the taft Holly Act. We knew that our campaign needed to be placed within the context of the conditions facing workers throughout the South that kept wages low, workers divided, communities underdeveloped, exposed to environmental dangers, and how the ban on collective bargaining rights for public section workers weakens the power of, working class, of the working class to influence and force changes of these conditions. In 2002, our union helped to form a coalition of unions, 
named HOPE, which is uh, Here Our Public Employees, together elements of the labor movement in North Carolina to begin a campaign to educate workers, legislators, and communities about how the ban on collective bargaining rights for public employees hurts the workers and the communities. We hope that by pointing out how the South was a major region in the global economy, that other local unions that were members of HOPE, as well as the leadership of the NCAFL-CIO might be able to get their national unions and federations to put some, so, some resources to help support the campaign and focus more on organizing in the South, but this was not the case. It wasn't until 2004 when our union and the Black Workers for Justice, a, a, a close ally, formed the Southern International Workers Justice Campaign that demand for collective bargaining rights for, to take on a social movement character. The SIWJ organized public hearings across, this, across at churches, fellowship halls, union halls, community centers, and mobilized communities, clergy, elected officials to create a forum of workers to come forward openly to talk about working conditions and the connections they had to the conditions in the communities throughout North Carolina. Making the connections between the conditions at work and the wider conditions of the working class was critical to how we argued that labor rights are human rights. The delivery of public and human services and social programs primarily, primarily depended upon by the working class and the income needed to support families and communities and to fuel the general economy was pointed out to make this connection. When we filed the complaint with the International Labor Organization and Agency of the United Nations in 2005, we understood that the LOA lacks the tools and, and authority for enforcing its labor conventions and standards at this juncture. However, we see it as an important international body for helping to expose and isolate the non-compliance by countries with international conventions that embody core rights guaranteeing the basic democracy for workers. We see using the ILO and this convention and labor standards as a way of helping to promote international labor solidarity and to educate and the need to mobilize labor's rank and file power to force recognition and establishment of these rights. However, a favorable ruling of the ILO complaint was not, was not a precondition for our continued organizing of the public sector workers, which constitutes the largest base of our statewide union. Building labor organizations and a southern labor movement as an organic part of empowering and educating working class at the point of production, service, and community to strengthen the unity and power of the working class, to improve working and living conditions, and to be, forced, and be a force helping to bring about fundamental change in our union's main goal. In 2005, the SWIJC and our union bought delegations of workers from all of the locations where we held public hearings at a statewide hearing in Raleigh, the capital of North Carolina, to give testimony to the International Commission of Labor Rights at a network of, and a network of Jewish which came from South Africa, Mexico, France, Canada, G Germany, Japan, and India. The ICLR produced a major report showing the violations and of the conventions of the ILO. This was the basis of the ILO complaint filed in December 2005. In mid-September of 2006, 50 workers from the, Raleigh, from the city of Raleigh held a wildcat strike. They stayed in the yard, refusing to drive their trucks to pick up trash and other refuse, demanding an end to forced overtime and a half, time and a half pay for overtime instead of comp time, safe working conditions, and the hiring of permanent employees instead of long-time temporary workers. In November 2011, sanitation workers in, Green, in Greenville, North Carolina, struck a one-day strike following the model that, uh, from the strike in Raleigh, staying on site and refusing to drive their trucks. Both of these strikes were illegal in North Carolina and defined by the Natural General Statute 9598 as being a firing offense. However, no one, not one of them at each location were fired and they won back their basic demands because our union engaged in organizing efforts at both locations. Many members joined our union. In December of two, 2006, our union and the SIWJC endorsed and helped mobilize for and participated in convening in the first 
Historical Thousand on Jones Street, a broad assembly called for by Reverend Dr. William J. Barber, a leader of the Moral Money. Right there, I want to stop and say that that first HK on J, we had, it was, in, it was Dr. Dr. Barber's envision as far as justice. So it was a 14 point agenda, it was covered everything from environmental to education to labor rights to uh, health care, whatever you could think of, it covered that. But the main thing was that the 11th plank in that 14 points was collective bargaining for public employees. That's where we fit in, and that's what made us so vital to the Moral Monday movement as it, as it continues. Um, okay. We were part of the committee leading the People's Assembly Labor Rights Workshop that proposed the resolution that passed establishing collective bargaining rights to public employees, which was number 11 plank I said. HKLJ gave birth to the moral money movement that demands that the state repeal its ban on collective bargaining for public employees and implement the ruling of the ILO. Many elected officials in the North Carolina state legislation recognizing the concentration of an anti-labor right to work laws in the South the strong, the strong features of structural racism in the social institutions and the repression, including the tax and denial of basic rights for immigrant workers with little or any except of degree of American exceptionalism that allows the USA to refuse to be accountable to international standards that are not shaped by US domestic and global interests. This caused men to be afraid to, of being isolated and attacked by ruling class corporate and right wing forces like the Chambers of Commerce, Tea Party, and ultra right wing uh, supremacist groups. We believe that the ILO complaint and the ruling that North Carolina is in violation of international conventions gave some legislators the confidence to come forward to introduce the first bill to repeal the legal ban on collective bargaining rights of public employees. While the repeal ban was kept in committees and prevented from coming to the floor for a vote in the legislature. It helped us to identify allies to help defend against attacks on labor organizations. We have found ways to maintain this relationship with allies to support our union's efforts to organize in North Carolina. We involved them on panels of public hearings dealing with workplace related, related issues and in, in being part of delegations to carry out forms of workplace inspections at various workplaces and divisions with patterns of safety violations, forms of demonstration of discrimination, understaffing, and repressive working conditions. The legislators invite workers to bring their testimonies about these patterns to legislative committees and, and press conferences, making the demand for collective bargaining rights as part of the political landscape of the struggle for civil and human rights. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Susan. Okay, um, okay uh, so I have many thoughts about these questions. Um, all right, so uh, I've sort of experienced uh, multiple times the awkwardness of being around someone who doesn't think that labor rights is a useful concept. Um, so one of them was at the um, Canadian, sort of the big Canadian academic conference. It was in British Columbia. Um, and an author of one of the articles that Cecilia sent out, um, uh, he, was at, he, was in the, he was in our panel and he was like, oh, I think that this idea of using the ILO or human rights to bolster um, labor unions is not a good idea. And he was very scornful. Um, his name was Larry Savage. And uh, so um, I, I didn't understand that it, it was sort of a political position of his. Um, he he worked on this book called um, uh, about the destruction of the Canadian labor, I guess, movement under various conservative governments. And so he felt very strongly about the importance of sort of on the ground uh, labor organizing, right? So, uh, you know, strikes and mobilizing members. So to him, it was really important to, to emphasize one over the other. And the other time that, that really sticks out in my mind was I was at the University of Manchester last fall and I was giving a talk uh, about um, at their political economy working group. And political economy in the UK is, is sort of more of a left-wing uh, approach than it is in the United States. Um, so it's sort of a room of bona fide uh, English leftists um, who, who publish in, in uh, journals like Capital and Class. Um, and uh, I was presenting very preliminary research on uh, 
trade unionists in Greece doing something very similar to what the UE was doing. And so what they are doing is um, responding to a lot of these reforms that the IMF and the European Commission and the European Central Bank have, have forced them to take on as a result of the financial crisis in 2008. And um, all of these reforms have been, have been um, very top down, right? So things like cuts to pension, cuts to um, retire, uh, retirement ages, uh, so limits to retirement, um, things like uh, holiday pay and just wage caps just being enforced, right? So just overturning uh, collectively bargained agreements that have been in place for, for um, decades. And so they, they don't really have anywhere to go um, because these it's a very unique legal situation. Um, but trade unions don't want to just accept them, right? So one of the things that they've done is they've gone to the European uh, Social Rights Committee, which is another one of these international fora where they can sort of make their case. They've gone to the ILO and they've said, look, these um, IMF, European Commission reforms, they violate our, our universal human rights. And so I talked about this process, but uh, some of the people in the audience were like, well, this is just a liberal framework. It's so limiting. Um, so uh, like I said, I've experienced this several times um, by people who are very skeptical of this as both a political strategy and as a research agenda. And I guess I want to talk about that first. So <clears throat> the first thing I want to say to that is I disagree with this idea that human rights are a liberal concept, even though in the United States and in a lot of uh, Western contexts, that's what's understood as. So um, as part of the evidence for this claim, I want to take us back to the history of human rights um, sort of at its origin. So if you look at the actual history of human rights, it's not a bunch of um, like corporate oriented Western powers that just get together and say, let's create a bunch of rights that will make it easy for us to promote liberal values. It's, it, it was much more contested than that, right? So the countries that came together in San Francisco in 1947, right? So following World War II, you know, people were getting together and saying, we don't want the atrocities of World War II to occur again. So what are the basic things that we think human beings all have a right to, regardless of where they live, regardless of their creed or nationality or, or, or you know, race or sex? So uh, co countries from, you know, um, Europe, Asia, Latin America, North America, they got together. Um, they were, there wasn't as much from Africa at the time, um, but they, they got together, Egypt was present, and they, they, they came up with a set of values that made up the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it wasn't just things like your uh, right to uh, religion, freedom of religion, or just your um, right to free speech against your government. It was much more expansive than that, and that's something that most Americans don't know, a lot of American students don't know, we think of human rights as being limited to individual rights. So for example, here in New York State, the New York State Human Rights Commission will take your complaint if you feel you've been discriminated against, right? So things having to do with your gender, your race, your ethnicity, your religion, uh, your um, status if you're a person with disability. So if you've been discriminated against in a job, school, or housing situation, you take your complaint to the New York State Commission, and then the New York City has a similar type of commission. And that's great, but that's a limited view of human rights. Human rights aren't just limited, it's not just about discrimination, right? So, um, so this is a common view, and I think that by saying, by talking about labor rights in its broader way, uh, we're, we're sort of bringing attention to the, the way that human rights are much more expansive. Okay, so to go back to that original discussion about what human rights are, um, so, Scholars like to divide human rights into two categories. So the first generation is um, what we think of as our individual rights. Uh, so our rights to vote, free speech, and those are the liberal rights. So they're traditionally called the political and civil rights. And the second group are the economic, social, and cultural rights. So the rights that we might think of being as the collective rights. So our rights to things like um, housing, our rights to things like food, um, our rights to... Uh, Holidays, paid holidays, that's included in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I know a lot of Americans don't have paid holidays, but that doesn't mean that it's not a human right. Our rights to have health care, um, our rights to a fair standard of living, whether or not you're able to work, right? So these are basic human rights that have been erased from our understanding of human rights. Um, so if we actually take a human rights approach to uh, justice or to activism, it includes this very expansive um, set of I guess, norms that we don't talk about. And the reason why we don't talk about them is because of the Cold War, right? So the Universal Declaration was expansive, but then when countries got together in the United Nations to create harder treaties, um, 
so the things that became that countries later ratified, because the Universal Declaration is more of, a, of an understanding, it's more of soft law. Um, there was a lot of fights about, should we give legal uh, weight to things like a right to housing or your right to a uh, fair wage? Um, and they couldn't come up to, they couldn't agree to it, right? So as you could imagine, the countries that were associated with the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, they were like, yeah, we should definitely give legal status to these um, civil, I mean, these economic, social, and cultural rights, because those are the values that we think are the most important. And the United States and the West, they were like, ah, seems kind of commie, right? So they were afraid of what would happen if there was legal binding power given to these economic, social, and cultural rights. So as a result, there became the split, right? So this led to the creation of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, which the United States has ratified, but um, it, the other one is the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which the United States hasn't ratified, right? So we see that the U.S. has traditionally taken this liberal approach and um, reinforces it as well. And the United States in general is uh, a big lagger when it comes to ratifying international uh, human rights treaties. Another thing that you should think about as well uh, when we're discussing human rights as a strategy, it hasn't ratified very many. It's ratified things like uh, the rights of the child, but it sort of takes some reservations. Um, it's ratified the um, uh, the economic, sorry, not, uh, the civil and political rights one. But um, in general, this is another Cold War thing as well. There was a big fear coming from the U.S. South um, in the 1950s and 60s that if the United States ratified um, all these international human rights treaties, that would lead to um, communism, as well as ending um, what, what does call it apartheid, right? Jim Crow in the Southern United States. So that's why we've limited our understanding of human rights so much. And so I guess my argument about do human rights approaches subvert traditional labor solidarities is that I don't think it does unless you take a very limited and a sort of a, a liberal approach to human rights. Um, and I think that one of the things that uh, scholars like myself and activists are doing is we're trying to expand what we think are as human rights. And what I think is useful about this is that the point of human rights is that you're making something not uh, vulnerable to the vagaries of politics at that moment, right? So if you're saying that this is my human right, my right to a fair trial, you're saying that if a governor gets elected who thinks, hey, you don't deserve a fair trial, that it doesn't matter if it's a human right, he shouldn't be able, or she should not be able to legislate that away. And so the benefit of saying that workers' rights are human rights is that you're saying that it's not legitimate, even if it's still legal, to make that a legislative um, you know, uh, thing that can be changed. So what which we saw in places like Wisconsin um, starting in 2011 under the leadership of Governor Scott Walker, right? So um, the public sector employees there had a long tradition of organizing, of militancy, um, and being able to collectively bargain over a wide range of, of, uh, of topics. But um, following in 2011, the legislature and the governor uh, got rid of a lot of those rights. So um, certainly in... Wisconsin in the Capitol during those uh, protests, you saw signs that said labor rights are human rights um, because they recognize the importance of sort of trying to take away the political uh, um, component as well. So, uh, right, so that's the, I think that's the value. So you're trying to say that legislatures shouldn't be able to get rid of these governors, um, shouldn't be able to um, take these rights away from workers, even if they are allowed to do so, you're making a, a political argument and you're making a moral one as well. Um, and then, uh, just, just as a, my fellow panelists has said, has said, taking a human rights approach doesn't preclude other forms of, of organizing. It doesn't preclude um, different forms of solidarity. It doesn't preclude wildcat strikes, certainly, uh, which you know I'm, I deeply admire. And, uh, uh, I, do, and I, I think that another thing it does is that it does sort of try to place the United States and its labor activity within a broader comparative context, right? So one of the things that we spoke about at dinner was, well, what's it like in Canada? Uh, which we'll learn more about, uh, our northern neighbor, which is very similar to the United States. And oftentimes in Canada, workers have much better rights uh, because what they think of as being appropriate to change is so, is so different. Um, similar as well to Western Europe. Um, and um, I also, every now and then, so I, I'm a professor at CUNY. We had a strike authorization vote. And I was one of the organizers for this uh, strike authorization vote. And I would speak to some of the, my fellow faculty members from other countries. 
um, and not necessarily just from Western European countries, but they said, what? You don't have a right to strike here? Because in other countries, the right to strike is uh, maybe is, is incorporated into con the country's constitution, right? So the fact that public sector workers in New York State don't have a right to strike, that puts us at odds with the international community. It doesn't make us normal, right? So that's, I think that's another part of the, the conversation that I think that's useful. Okay, um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about as well is uh, how labor rights um, work in together with all these individual rights. So one of the things Larcine mentioned was that there wasn't any collective bargaining rights in North Carolina, and this disproportionately affected um, women and people of color. And I think that one of the things that you see is that in the United States, we have a broad consensus about how important it is to protect these individual level rights. Um, so the EEOC is one of the most empowered federal agencies um, to sort of intervene on the rights, uh, on the behalf of workers uh, in, in instances of discrimination. Um, in fact, uh, there was a book written uh, in 2013 uh, by, where is it, um, Marvit and, um, yes, uh, Kallenberg, yeah. Uh, it was called, they, they're looking at the, the role that the fact that the National Labor Relations Board didn't have the power to sanction employers the way that the EEOC does. Um, but I think that one of the things that you see when you look at some of these EEOC cases is that the, uh, how fundamentally important it is for, to have a, for workers to have a union, to represent them, to even inform them of their rights, um, to work with employers, to advocate uh, in, in instances of discrimination. Uh, so we see, for example, one of the most anti-union companies in the United States is Walmart. Um, they've been fighting off unions for decades, and they've also been hit up with many lawsuits because of discrimination based on uh, gender. And so you need, even though we all agree on the importance of individual rights, you often need unions to enforce these things, right? You need that collective component. Workers need that voice uh, in the workplace. Um, and uh, I think that, the, but the, the, the thing that really, uh, I guess, um, I think about a lot is that we have this consensus about how we shouldn't discriminate. And if you look at corporations, um, like annual reports or, or their corporate social responsibility documents, which are these documents they put out, they say that we are, you know, I don't know, we're John Deere, we, we do this, we do that, right? We're environmentally sustainable. Um, they always talk about the fundamental importance of, of workplace diversity, right? Having a diverse workforce, uh, women and people of color in managerial positions, right? So, you know, corporations fully agree and take on the importance of diversity. But I think that that, that sort of demonstrates that the, the, the dominance of this liberal framework. So what we need to do, so both workers, both trade unionists, academics, um, those who are going to be middle class professionals, um, is that we need to work on discussing the importance of economic justice, right? Because rights don't guarantee uh, certain outcomes, right? They don't guarantee equality. They don't guarantee redistribution. So what's gone away, I think, with the end of the Cold War um, that's really been eroded since uh, Reagan really took on labor rights is this discussion that equity, right, and um, redistribution is an important thing that we need to, t um, to value as well. Um, uh, how much time do I have? Okay, um, so uh, just a couple more minutes. Um, so just sort of to think about this, uh, sort of in the contemporary context, a lot of people talk about the Democratic caucus that emerged that elected uh, President Obama a couple uh, twice now, right? Which was, um, I think, if you were not experiencing it, thinking about it externally, you wouldn't have predicted it, right? Um, and this was made up of by a number of sort of social groups, so uh, union members, people of color, women, um, some many members of the LGBTQ community, and also. Uh, the mostly white, but not exclusively white, professional work, um, professional middle class, right? So this is sort of the key component of the Obama uh, caucus. And so that we sort of think of this as being the, the bread and butter of the Democratic Party. But one of the things that we don't see is that we're not seeing a lot of support for labor rights and redistribution from the mostly white professional middle class. Um, and that's something that needs to change, I think, not only to maintain that coalition, right, if we're going to continue to have sort of Democratic leadership in this country, which would make sense from, a, I guess, a census point of view, because uh, most of the people who don't vote in this country tend to have values that, that, uh, that, that line up with Democrats. But also, um, because when we don't see that solidarity, then you get the deplorables, right? Because there's a lot of 
there's a lot of attempts to write off those who are supporting Trump as merely being um, you know, inhuman, but rather as opposed to understanding what are the political and economic conditions that lead to the frustrations right, that we see today. Um, and when we, we think about things like globalization, we think about things like automation, there's not a lot of, of discussion public policy-wise or within academic circles about how we you know, move towards automation and, and uh, technology and, and technological changes and globalization in a matter that's more just, that's inclusive and considers the human rights of everybody involved. Um, and that's one of the things I think that is for the students in this room, that's something that you guys need to think about as well. Uh, John Maynard Keynes thought that automation would lead to leisure. Right? Where's your leisure? I don't have that much leisure, right? So we have so much more automation, but we work more than we ever did, right? So we need to think of new models of organizing work and value that that challenge this idea that somebody else's production abroad is going to hurt my bread and butter, butter butter here today. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. The folks who are running the HVAC system in here are really good, or I'm getting sick, but uh, it's warm. Uh, for where I come from, if you need to stand up and stretch your phalanges, feel free to do that. These are your phalanges, by the way. Okay, so I'm gonna do something a little bit different. Um, I'm gonna tell a story from the Canadian context to try and address these three questions. Are the slides gonna be okay? Yeah, we're just going to get the... Okay. Well, this is a good chance for you to actually take that physical stretch if you need to. Okay. We're good? Uh, no, I, if Todd doesn't mind just going along with it. Okay. So, <laughs> I'll get started. <laughs> People need to move. That's quite all right with me. So in 06, Canadians elected a conservative federal government. And we'd been watching and learning from you guys, the corporate elite and the alternate right Republicans down here. And I must say, on our side, the, the, dark, the desire to follow the dark side was very strong with our leaders. Maybe because you have cookies. <laughs> okay. So one of the first things that our version of your GOP did was to dramatically promote a temporary migration scheme to literally fill any job in the Canadian workforce. And the priority, of course, was to get workers to fill low-wage jobs. Now, today, that number of temporary migrant workers in Canada is uh, well past 600,000. Now, there's two slides that are going to show up in this sequence that actually put these numbers into a global context, which is my attempt to address question number two about the uh, market-driven globalization agenda. Also, the majority of these workers that came to Canada come from racialized countries, particularly Southeast Asia, the Caribbean, Central America, and India. Now, this reality created both solidarity and xenophobic responses from unions and workers and the broader public. The expansion of market-driven policies also means that racialized women are added to our workforce as caregivers. More than 90% come from the Philippines, and basically they're tending to white folks' kids and white folks' elders. It's a bit of an irony, a historical redux, that white women can now go to work as brown and black women watch their families. The promotion of temporary versus permanent labor migration, of course, though, is not unique to Canada. In 06, the United Nations high-level dialogue, led by the International Organization on Migration, actually pushed countries to integrate labor markets globally for greater labor force flexibility, i.e., they said, get on board with temporary migration schemes. And a lot of OEC countries did just that. So in the Canadian context, with just one policy move to increase the intake of the global supply of low-wage labor for literally every single occupation in the country, we had the perfect storm. The perfect storm to witness human rights clash with the traditional notion of labor rights. We had the chance to analyze how market-driven globalization creates opportunities and challenges in advancing solidarity and worker struggle. And finally, we had the chance to see all of the above through the lenses of gender and race. From 06 to 2014, our government kept ratcheting down a variety of policy levers that increased the numbers, 
encouraged exploitation, and they turned a knowing and blind eye to fraud, corruption, and even human trafficking. Now, these actions and inactions significantly contributed to their election defeat in 2015. And that's a takeaway in terms of the value of diversifying the labor movement and what I want to get to in my story. The rising number of migrant workers coincided with high unemployment levels and stagnant wage growth. And that's really no surprise since our government also allowed employers to pay migrant workers 15% below the pre pre prevailing wage rate alongside members of the national workforce who were doing the same job in the work, same work site. So a conscious decision to drive wages down for everybody. Now, another example of our program is temporary work permits tie an employer to tie a worker to his employer, limiting job mobility. Pretty clear case of human and labor rights violations. There was also the absence of meaningful compliance, monitoring, and enforcement of wages and working conditions, <clears throat> and it created no shortage of abuse stories, like specialized construction workers from Central America paid as little as $5 an hour, workers not being paid at all, and literally being sold from one employer to another. IT savvy migrants being brought into the banking sector and trained by the very workers who they're going to be laid off because the migrants are going to take their digital jobs offshore with them when their contracts end. Or workers given, being given their paychecks, then driven to the bank by the boss, and then forced to cash the paycheck and return the wages to the employer for specious accommodation and program processing costs. Our annual intake numbers of migrants ex exceeded the number of incoming permanent immigrants, and it also exceeded the numbers who became unemployed when our economy met the toilet in 2008 and 2009. The two important things happened simultaneously now. Members of the national workforce who had been witnessing their jobs going to migrant workers, most of whom were people of color, at reduced wage and working conditions, demanded that the program be ended and that these workers be deported. Xenophobic rhetoric was not hard to find within the labor movement and the broader community. Anti-migrant worker websites emerged. Nativism, xenophobia, racist commentary found an even stronger foothold in Canada. Strident politicians exploited the sentiment and they looked for scapegoats rather than at their own policies. But something else also happened. Some folks understood that the rise of migrant worker numbers was yet another example of a corporate-driven globalization agenda that unabashedly was determined to screw workers. Some saw this as a threat as a clear case of both human rights violations and a policy choice to threaten collective labor rights. Responding differently, innovatively, meant a chance to diversify the labor movement. For example, Migrant workers' legal status in Canada, for the most part, is literally tied to one employer. That is framed as being akin to slavery, the master-servant model that colonialism packs wherever it goes. Those holding temporary work permits are limited in their freedom of employment choice and mobility, and it is argued that our program, our temporary foreign worker program, is not in sync with the UN Declaration of Human Rights, particularly the Articles 2, 4, 7, 13, 20, 23, 24, and 25, and this slide will remind you what those are. Canada's program systemically enables gender exploitation and workplace sexual abuse. For example, our government leaders signed a memorandum of understanding with Mexico requiring that agricultural workers coming to Canada must have children and family in their home country because that's so important for picking tobacco. Really, what it implies, of course, is that the worker will likely leave at the end of the harvest season to return to families left behind. Agricultural job descriptions are skewed to favor males over females. Caregivers are disproportionately female and endure a higher rate of sexual and employment abuse. These are all cases of human rights violations. But traditional labor rights are also under threat. If an employer can get away with these violations on those temporary work permits, how long before that standard becomes the workplace norm? In fact, in 2012, our government granted employers, as I said, the right to pay migrant workers 15% below the prevailing wage rate alongside any member of the national workforce doing the same job at the same site. Yep, so nationals are treated as badly as migrant workers. But the policy was so stealthily designed, so geniusly designed, to drive wages across the board across all sectors because in 07 they had opened up the doors to allow migrant workers to fill any occupation in any part of the Canadian economy. So you put the two together, you drive wages down. 
So the only sensible thing to do was to fight back with a strong human rights agenda and not to default to a xenophobic response. It also meant thinking beyond our borders and engaging with international bodies such as the ILO and the UN and relevant human rights and labor rights covenants. While the threat of jobs not going to Canadian residents was acknowledged by Labour, it did not deter progressive unions to pose new forms of solidarity to protect jobs and to grow the Labour movement. Let me give you a couple of examples. <clears throat> the Canadian Union of Postal Workers realized that migrants came to Canada for jobs and sent the majority of their earnings back home to families left behind. The transactions often take place via banks or worse through Western Union or the like. The wire transfer fee takes a large percentage of very meager earnings. Cup W workers proposed to their employer, Canada Post, a national restructuring of our post office, specifically to provide banking services via every national outlet in the country, thus making international money transfers affordable and accessible to everyone, including migrant workers living and working in the country. Now that bargaining proposal is innovative because it forms solidarity that benefits migrant workers, but also the Cup W workers who are fighting to keep a public mail service relevant in the age of the interweb and Amazon's delivery by drone service. Example two, live-in caregivers, as I mentioned, disproportionately from the Philippines, they're prone to workplace ex exploitation and sexual predation by their employers. That's because the program required those workers to live in the employer's home, resulting in a 24-7 working condition of potential oppression. Now, live-in caregivers also have to complete X number of hundreds of hours of employment under these conditions within a finite time period if they want to qualify for a pathway to permanent residency in Canada. So imagine when the boss pops a tic-tac and decides to sexually harass his worker, well, complaining is the risk of being fired and losing your chance at status and no chance to sponsor your kids who you've been separated from for two years to join you in the country. So unions and community activists came together to offer a different form of solidarity action to challenge a program that enables human rights and workplace violations. We partnered with our allies in sending countries who were conducting pre-departure orientation of caregivers headed to Canada. That meant that we learned when a caregiver was going to go to work for Mr. and Mrs. BMW, we could then send our, the, the, our workers information about that specific employer, like if they had any workplace violations on file, which is a pretty useful piece of information for any worker to know. We also trained union and community volunteers to go and knock on Mr. and Mrs. BMW's door in their well-heeled community, typically armed with a cake or a bottle of wine. And this small cadre of community-based human rights activists let Mr. and Mrs. BMW know that they were looking forward to welcoming Flora, the live-in caregiver, when she arrived. They were gonna be dropping by regularly to show her around her new community. And they wanted Mr. and Mrs. BMW to know that there were local people who were watching out for them. Voila, an innovative merger of human and labor rights brought to your doorstep. By the way, telecom workers wanted to enhance this initiative, even though they just cross-border solidarity. They wanted to uh, provide migrant workers with a SIM card courtesy of their employer loaded with 30 minutes of talk time and a welcome text message that linked them to a community support network, a union, union community support network. So the SIM cards are handed out to folks before they depart their sending country via our allies. And upon arrival, they pop the SIM card in and instantly they're connected with our network, which is a lot better than trying to find help after you're in crisis. Finally, example three, when specialized constructor, construction workers from Central and South America were subjected to wage and working condition discrimination relative to their European white migrant counterparts, a Canadian construction union took up their case and invested over a million dollars plus staff time to file human rights and labor relations complaints with relevant tribunals in British Columbia. Now that took years, that battle, but wins were eventually realized. That same union committed staff time to help those workers file their tax returns. You see, migrant workers in Canada get taxed, but they're denied meaningful access to social service benefits for which they had been paid into via their payroll deductions. Likewise, they're stymied from collecting their tax refunds. So UFCW and the construction workers unions in BC fought to win millions 
24 million, I think, was in the, in the UFCW case, in owed maternity benefits and tax refunds for migrant workers. So I'll just stop there, and I'm hoping that those three examples spark a conversation in relation to the three questions that we've got on the table. Thank you very much, Paul. Well, I think, uh, I think you'll agree that we've had some very stimulating and interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I guess I just have a few comments to make. It seems that, uh, you know, one of the issues here is whether, you know, a human rights agenda is an end in itself or a means to an end. And I think it's pretty uh, clear from all of the speakers that what we're seeing is that, uh, you know, human rights agenda for labor rights is uh, not necessarily um, at odds, but as long as it's a means to an end for expanding uh, uh, labor's rights uh, uh, within a kind of human rights agenda. So that's one of the takeaways I, I, I get from that. Um, I think that that also, though, there are there are risks. And so, for example, the I'm from Canada. I've been studying a little bit about some of the struggles there around uh, labor rights and human rights. So um, this might seem kind of astounding to an American audience, but uh, there's something called the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, which is basically the Canadian Constitution. Canada is always a little bit slower than the United States. And we had our Constitution not until 1982, right? So it was like about 120 years after we actually were formally independent. But you know, we did we do catch up at some point. Um, but uh, the Canadian Supreme Court has had a number of cases presented to it. So, for example, uh, over the last 10 years, um, the right to freedom of association and the right to collective bargaining have all been recognized as a fundamental right of the Constitution in Canada. And and those are are really major victories and very different, as I think you'll agree, from the kind of context that we have here. But um, as, as Carl has shown, um, in many cases, uh, those rights alone uh, don't simply uh, guarantee, especially for migrant workers, but also uh, native Canadian-born uh, workers, uh, uh, real rights uh, in the sense of uh, what they actually can do in a day-to-day -day basis. And those really, really depend on the capacity of labor organizations in particular to mobilize around those rights, uh, to uh, make people aware that they're, they're actually there. So that's, I think, the thing is like the use of uh, the human rights agenda, the human rights rhetoric as a, a means to an end rather than an end in itself, I think is, is one of the things that I take away from this. And I know that there was a couple of questions at the beginning about, um, about things like um, you know, uh, increased automation and so forth like this. And certainly um, there's, there's a lot of discussion around this. So the McKinsey, uh, uh, the consultants just put a report out saying that within the next five years, 6% of all jobs uh, at a global level will, will disappear due to, to automation. And so there's, there's a new wave that's coming along. And the important thing is that it, this uh, automation is not simply about replacing quote unquote a low level blue collar jobs. Um, um, that's often been the sop that has been given to people that it's okay as long as you get an education, uh, you'll be able to, to do all right. But increasingly these are into what we call so-called middle class uh, types of jobs. Um, anything that can be repetitive in terms of information is increasingly being able to be automated. The question, and I think this was also brought up by the panel, is, you know, okay, what do we do about this? Can we, as Keynes said, uh, use this to actually expand people's free time uh, in, in a meaningful way, in a way where their standard of living is not uh, catastrophically affected? And it seems to me that, again, this notion of a, of a means to an end is, one is this uh, right, which was in the 1948 uh, Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a right to a meaningful or a, 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 a good income, an income that was a, promoted dignity for people. Um, and it's interesting because um, the business community is now getting actually quite interested in what we call this basic or guaranteed annual income. So in Silicon Valley, there's been a lot of uh, attention being paid to this. But the important thing uh, from their perspective is that, of course, is how low can we set this, uh, this minimum wage for the people who are going to be displaced through these new waves of automation in order to just sort of keep consumption ticking over. Um, uh, it's a question of uh, what degree of dignity is going to be associated with that. I also think that in terms of you know where should we go with these rights, and one of the things that, uh, as someone who's done a lot of work, what I call workplace research, is 
the appalling lack of democracy that exists in almost all workplaces, um, that the people who actually do the jobs and perform the necessary functions often have the least say over what they actually do. And I think that one of the, the, the real things that, that um, I think the unions and, and uh, other groups should be working towards is a right to uh, democratic control over the workplace, whether it's forms of co-determination. And this isn't pie in the sky. I mean, co-determination exists in Scandinavian nations. They haven't collapsed. Uh, Germany has co-determination. Uh, they haven't collapsed. In fact, they're in some ways some of the most competitive capitalist countries in the world. Um, but you know, the, we simply don't uh, even seem to have those kinds of rights here. They're not even on the agenda at the moment. And I would say that as a right uh, uh, that people should be collectively and individually thinking about is, is this right to a greater uh, collective uh, decision making uh, at the workplace level. So that's my kind of two cents. Um, so what I would like to do at this point is to turn uh, uh, things over to you, to you, uh, the audience. Uh, you've been very patient, and um, I know people have questions and so forth. So uh, I'm quite happy to come around with the microphone if anybody wants to ask some more questions to uh, our panel. Yes. Since we've been on the topic of automation right now, um, Ms. Kang, you brought up the notion of equality versus equity, something that uh, I, as a student of Steve Park's class, we're studying rather in depth with the current neoliberal economic theory that we have in the United States. My personal fear and question really is this. If uh, automation, no doubt, will affect uh, labor jobs as well as middle class jobs, and we've seen reports of how examples of robotics, they do, the robotics that will replace these jobs, they will require people to maintain them. But they require an education, which comes at a financial barrier, a financial cost, which, in my opinion, prohibits uh, you know, e equity, really, uh, and a system of fairness. Uh, I'm a privileged student. I'm privileged to be here, and I come from a privileged economic background. I could possibly go for that job. Somebody who might come from an impoverished um, background who couldn't afford to go to this university or to a tech school just to get that job, which would possibly de be defined as the future middle class job. I guess my concern is in the next 20 years, how can we fight for equity when just as we're establishing equity using humans as labor, we're now trying to fight against machinery in terms of equity of labor? in that case. I, uh, Why don't we get, allow people to, to reply to that and then we can go into other questions after that. So yeah, so whoever wants to. I, I agree with everyth everything you said. <coughs> I, I would just take it a step further though and say that, you know, rather than only focus on making it a meritocracy where <clears throat> people from any background can attain this middle class or whatever lifestyle that we're talking about, you know, let's face it. Labor is not fully transferable. There are people who will never, ever be able to, even if they have access to education, will not be able to uh, code robots, okay? And, you know, as a human being, you have a right to a standard, not just as a person who can code a robot, you have a right to a standard. So, I mean, I, I would just caution us from, you know, just purely, you know, saying, okay, we, as our robot overlords are taking you know, our labor from us, and this could be, I mean, I, I, I know people sort of scoff at it, but it is an opportunity for a utopia at the end of the day where, you know, people are not working and it, under the right circumstances, it could, it's utopia. I mean, that's what we all want. But I think we just have to step back and say, hey, it's, you know, let's not just level the playing field because the truth is if, if we're getting rid of, you know, <coughs> you know, lower skilled labor, um, as, 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 as a thing that pays, um, you know, there are people who will never be able to, co to, 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 to code a robot. I'm one of them. Um, and we can't forget about people like me. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, that's a great question. A couple of quick responses. I think the, the automation taking jobs is already here. I used the example of RBC in Canada. Um, bringing in migrant workers because the work could be done digitally after they were trained for six months in Canada and then the work goes offshore. Um, 
And so what's the consequence, what's the solution to that? And in that particular instance, the public outcry to say, you can't offshore work that was being done here and make that a policy standard. Now that only became something that people were prepared to fight for when the Indian IT workers took the 40 year old white guy's job. They didn't give a shit about it when it was the A&W worker who was a brown guy. Okay. That was, that was my father. That was my father's job. Yeah. He was in the IT industry. He watched his job go overseas to India, and then afterwards, he watched India compete with China. Exactly. That exact same job, five cents an hour versus like two cents an hour. So I think I think we're definitely going to see that kind of automation, looking for the low wage capital. The solutions, I think, are drawn from that example of saying communities need to say that's not we're not going to permit that and alliances with the global south to say instead of turning that IT brain power in Chennai or Bangladesh for the profit and benefit of the banks in North America that IT power needs to go into the community development needs of that country that's a bit of a simplistic solution but it's part of the solution another chunk is when we see those manufacturing and IT jobs lose be lost here to automation and other circumstances we need to start speaking about investing in what other jobs Jobs do we need to see happen in North America? We have public and social infrastructure needs. We've got green economy network needs, okay? Pub, uh, high speed public transit, sustainable technologies. We know in Canada, for example, that we employ more people in the, in the solar and the sustainable industries than we do in the bitumen and the ONG industries. So, you know, there's a shift that has to take place, but that's going to take place when a lot more than uh, celebrities end up uh, stopping the North Dakota access pipeline. When l large numbers of average people stand up and say, no, corporate greed is not going to overtake community need. And we're going to define what kind of jobs that we want in our community and under what wage and working conditions. And we're not going to lose sight of the people in other countries who are in similar circumstance. Those are very big challenges. Susan, did you? Oh, no. I mean, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else has a question? Yeah. David, you have a To um, solve my depressed, having heard the panelists and the comments, could they identify what they might regard as the optimal place at the current moment that has good, very good communal and relations of labor? Not North Carolina. <laughs> no, not for sure. Yeah. Can you like 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 actually existing? Or <laughs> I meant I meant of course internationally. Is there any model that we can look for and say that's what we should be aiming for? I think that's a really great question. Um, I think that there's no like ideal place at this point because even the places that we once thought of as being havens for workers like Scandinavia are, are fighting back. Um, they're fighting neoliberal cutbacks themselves. Um, so I don't, I don't really know if I could list one place. But I, I, when thinking about this, this earlier question, one place where I think that there's been this community um, response to reshaping sort of labor capital relations might be Iceland. Right now, um, we can see that their response to the financial crisis was radically different than the United States, right? So they nationalized their banks. They're having an election right now. The Pirate Party might become the dominant one there. Um, they had this walkout with women demanding uh, pa wage parity a couple days ago. So that's a place where there's definitely vibrant struggle, like with and outside of trade union contexts. So I wouldn't say that's like an ideal place, but that's a place where we can maybe look for policy models as well as activist models. But I'm not, you know, I know that, that Iceland's unique. There's, you know, there's fewer people in Iceland than there are in like Bronx. So, you know, the scale is very different, but uh, again, certainly the responses are something that we can look to, to uh, learn from. I'll, I'll add in, um, it's a, when I joined uh, social justice work and particularly the labor movement, I hung on to the word, it's gonna be a struggle long term. So I don't have any illusions that I was going to see an accomplishment in my lifetime on this particular battle. But places that I have been inspired by, when I think of recently the last couple of months, the millions of Indian workers who just 
participated in a major strike in India is impressive. I've, I've been in, in Mumbai, I've been in Delhi, I've been in some of those strikes. Uh, you know, when you're with a crowd of a half a million people on strike, and that was considered a small strike, it is inspiring, overwhelming, and yes, I did get lost. Um, <laughs> In South Africa, when I worked with the South African Municipal Workers Union who were facing uh, their employer, the ANC government, who was tasked with shutting off their neighbors' water and electricity services, as Nelson Mandela said so quietly that the world did not hear, privatization is the policy of our government after the IMF twisted my arm. The South African Municipal Workers Union did the bidding of the government. They went and organized workshops in communities to shut off their neighbors' water. And how we did it was we came into the communities and we had the sheets and the graphics and we brought everybody together and we said these steps, if you follow them precisely, and we did it step by step, will shut off the water. And if you reverse these steps, step by step, but bypass the meter, the water will flow again. So we turned on hundreds of thousands of people's electricity. We turned on hundreds of thousands of people water, break the meter, the water is free. Those were inspiring times. And when I remember specifically in one community, I went into a grandmother's house who'd had no electricity for two years, and my, my comrade with me, and you know, we were turning the power, just armed with a red toolbox and a few tools. And I, I asked my comrade, I said, I, how are we sure that the power is really off? Big jovial smile and laugh. He says, brother, you will know. <laughs> Very quickly, you will know. <laughs> Um, I, Korea, uh, the workers in Korea, militant direct action during the trade deals. And I would say even pockets in the US have done some amazing alliance building with non-unionized people of color, the car wash workers. Justice for Jenners, you have also a history. They're pockets, they're small, but they're worth taking note of. And they have scared corporate power. And so to me, that's the struggle is to amplify those experiences. And besides, what else have you got to do? Thank you. Thank you. So I want to, oh, wow. I want to um, thank the panel for a you know, really fantastic repertoire of stories and sharing your experiences with us. Um, and I want to get back to the whole question of human rights you know, versus labor rights, right? I, 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 there's one um, critique I have of um, you know, people who, the, those who are against the human rights approach, you know, when they say that what we need to do is to stick to sort of the traditional labor strategies and that particular critique who hasn't been mentioned by anyone and I want to know what you think of that you know which is that to me that critique and of course I mean I'm coming from a completely pro labor situation but that critique to me is a little bit insensitive about what do they mean by the traditional labor approaches the traditional grassroots labor approaches which you know um, you know in many ways are fantastic but it tends to kind of elide or suppress a certain, you know, problematic history of the labor union history as well, right? The fact that um, certainly in the early days, um, the labor organizations often, um, you know, did not represent certain marginalized sections. So the, I, I do think, while I'm uh, somewhat sympathetic to um, their critique, when their critique is presuming that the human rights approach is, you know, this individual liberal rights approach, I'm certainly sympathetic to that, I think there's a little bit of arrogance, you know, when, and this does, this happens in other fields as well, as well, when people sort of um, evoke this notion of our historical traditional rights. Um, on the one hand, um, I understand what they're saying. On the other hand, I do think there's a certain insensitivity to the sections of the population who were left out in the first place from some of these traditional struggles, so to speak. So I wondered if you had any thoughts about that. Do you see, and, and Lassin is frowning, but do you see what I mean? I mean, so in the case of North Carolina, it's easy for us to critique those folks because, you know, here government has basically made, it, the, the state government has made it impossible for people to have labor rights in the first place. But I'm thinking even the history of 
labor union struggles have not always been, you know, um, sort of perfect in terms of representing diverse communities. Okay. Um, in response to that, I would say that because uh, not so much as labor, although labor and, labor and civil rights are combined, we, we've learned that in the process. And I think that's what's helped us to grow. So we, we've always had that, that civil part of with NAACP. We've always had that going on for us. Uh, so, but once we combine the civil rights part of it with labor, it made us stronger, you know, in order to, to fight what, what we're dealing with. That's why coalition building in the South is you got to have it or you, you just won't make it. You just will not. I won't forget uh, we had a convergence. It was, like I said, it was Japan, Mexico, um, Canada, and the U.S. We met in, uh, the first one was in Mexico, and the second one was in Japan. And, um, no, I got it wrong. No, North Carolina and then, then Japan. So when I went to Japan, the first question out of their mouth was, how was Reverend Barbara? And uh, it didn't astound me, but the reason being was that all the events that they did when they came to North Carolina, they happened in, at a church. That's, that's the foundation of, of, of people of color in the South. Faith is the one thing that the government and nobody else can shake. We've always had that. And all our meetings back in the days, in the 60s and 70s, were done at churches, places like that. And so when they came, what, I mean, 20 years later, we're still having meetings at churches and stuff. It's so important for us to, to struggle. So when I got to Japan, like I said, the first thing they asked me was, how was Reverend Barber? You know, because he's been such a force to be reckoned with you know, in our union and in the state of North Carolina, period, and globally. I don't know how many of you are familiar with him. Uh, if you heard the Democratic speech that he gave, it rocked some worlds. That man is gonna make, gonna make some changes, you know. I'm so glad he's in North Carolina, so glad he's a part of what we're trying to do. And it's all about justice and equality. The, the moral money movement, is inclusive of everybody. You can't name anybody that doesn't fit in there. Like I said, it covers the climate, it covers the environment, it covers public, um, it covers education, it covers labor. You name it, it's all in there because everybody should be equal. We're all God's children and we should be created equal. Although we're not, that's why the fight is there. That's why we're struggling to make that difference. Yeah, her. Hmm. Oh, go ahead. Um, thanks, Cecilia. I think that's a great question. And, and I think uh, Savage and the, his colleagues in that camp, I've, I've five things come to mind for why he's wrong. Um, that, that approach of focusing on the bread and butter, the meat and potatoes, means that they're going to end up focusing on a very small number of unionized workers. It's very insular. Uh, it can't grow the movement. It can't grow the community. It can't grow anything. It's very white-centric, to be frank. It ignores youth. It ignores people of color. It ignores Aboriginal First Nations people. It ignores the disabled. All the groups that are going to make up an increasing percentage of our workforce. It ignores equity. Um, it, igno it turns your back on the opportunity to forge international alliances and tactical opportunities to kneecap corporate global power. And four, fifth, it's fun to do the human rights approach. Not only do you get frequent flyer points, you get to see and work with some amazing people around the world that are doing things differently. And that in and of itself is worth it. Any other comments? I just want to add one other thing. And again, not being an academic and actually being having these critiques newly raised to me <laughs> as I was uh, you know, flying up here, I, it strikes me as quite odd as like somebody who's a practitioner, you know, an organizer, a lawyer, because there is no, at least in the United States, there is no union that is exclusively using this human rights approach. There is no union that went to the, is not organizing workers, goes to the ILO and says, please, ILO, give us our right to collectively bargain. I mean, no one believes that. I mean, it's, 
It's not a real argument. I mean, this is not a real argument. I mean, because it's not really happening. I mean, it's just one tool in the toolbox. And if somebody's going to have a problem with me using a hammer, I don't care. I got to get a nail in the in, in the blank in the plank. You know. So it's it's it, it is. I mean, it's an interesting debate, but it is so theoretical and it's so not actually relevant to organizing work that's actually happening. I just wanted to say really quickly, I think we're in sort of this interesting mo moment of resurgence of collective action in the United States, at least based on what I'm observing. I mean, we seem to have more strikes in the news or organizing around strikes, strikes that get averted. We, I mean, we had that lockout in Long Island University. And I, I think that we are moving, even though it's new constituencies of workers that are moving towards strikes, I think that there is more uh, awareness of collective action and workplace action. And I think that that's a good thing and it's being done in, you know, together with discussions about rights. So, you know, I think that the, a lot of that discussion is a little bit older. It's like at least like 10, ten five to 10 years old. And so I think that what labor has been doing, uh, both in coalition with unprotected and unorganized workers, um, is it's, it's, it's very innovative. Well, it's, I found it all very stirring. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wonder, the, 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 there may be some advantage to the, the language also in terms of um, building a national coalition. Um, and I was just thinking, you know, we have political campaign going on, and it's amazing how little attention there is to uh, labor unions and labor working class people. Um, and maybe this kind of framing could make it easier to think of it as a national problem. Um, you know, that, that Sanders and Trump have made evident in a way. Um, and um, I wonder if, if there's some effort at that or thought of that uh, as a way of getting the Democratic Party to be what it once was, uh, something that was an ally of the workers. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're going to let the young people take the lead on that one, <laughs> and we'll follow happily. So. <laughs> Uh, maybe to follow up on his uh, question over here is a few years back we had the uh, Occupy Wall Street movement, which wasn't per se labor related, but the issues regarding income inequality is ultimately related to, to labor issues. Uh, and also the Bernie Sanders uh, movement, which is saying that they're not going to let up. They're going to have something happen. I don't know what, but can anybody on the panel see any way to channel what we had from the Occupy Wall Street movement and the potential of a, a uh, the Bernie Sanders, uh, you know, hopes for the uh, movement after the election, can you channel any of that energy into the labor movement? I would take one issue with something you said, and it's not nothing significant, but I think it, in a way it is. Occupy was not a labor um, action, but it, it, in it, but it was, I think, very clearly inspired by the the um, the um, methods of the labor movement. I mean, it's it's it was a sit down strike, and um, that's you know, it, it's one thing that you know we talk about the goals in a, in a movement. But in what, one thing I learned from Occupy or, or that remind, Occupy hammered home for me is the methods for change are um, are almost as important. The methods we choose to, to, to create change are almost important as what we're what we're pushing for because you're not going to get any change unless you're using the right methods. And I, I think Occupy was inspired by sort of like occupations of factories. And I think Occupy could continue because it was successful in a lot of ways. I think it could. You're right though. You we have to get workers to start using that technique at least that technique of claiming a space and not leaving, because that's sort of like, I think history shown, that's sort of like one really effective tool. So I would just say that. Yeah, yeah, and, and within UE we had, uh, I can't remember the name of the, the, yeah, Republic Windows, and they occupied the building, the plant that they were, they closed down, and yeah, that's definitely a way, and now it is, you know, now they own it, they run it, they own it, you know. You just have to take a stand, a, a collective stand, 
to do the right thing. It's sad, but it's true. We can, you know, it's just a fight, fight, fight. When are we gonna rest? <laughs> it's just a fight, fight, fight. Yeah. Um, uh, that's a really great, great question. So I, I was involved in Occupy Wall Street on Wall Street myself. Um, I was there on the first day, and I was trying to be involved as much as I could while being a professor. And um, a lot of the kids, because even though they're not children, but a lot of the young people from Occupy <clears throat> were on the front lines of sort of organizing around the Bernie Sanders campaign. So there's a lot of overlap, certainly, um, at least in New York City. Um, so I don't know to what extent we can take that, but what, what take that and move on. But what I know is that what Occupy did for me was it helped connect me to a lot of the left and radical components um, in my community. And I think that it may help network everyone together. And the, the question about technology was mostly a negative, but technology also helps with organizing. It helps with agitation. It helps with political activity. So one of the things that we know is that, you know, Bernie Sanders has his email list, right? There's all these networks that are through you know social media, so I think that there definitely can be something. We just don't have anything yet, and um, I don't think that the, the the coalition that got built up around Bernie Sanders is dead. But there's no focal point right now. There's something called our revolution, but it's kind of eh, it's not really clear what it is. There's some dissent amongst the staff, um, but um, I'm um, interested and and. and you know, curious and you know, enthusiastic about the next stage, whatever that might be. Um, and I, I know that many other people are as well. If I can, uh, that those last two questions, I think, were great pairing them together under the you know what to do next. Maybe is how I heard it. And and some things come to mind. And and this first comment is directed at my own experience at the Canadian Union. I wouldn't be so arrogant to suggest anything for the American leadership in the movement. But one thing I've seen in the Canadian leadership movement is there is a necessity for Canadian unions and leaders um, to let go to get over their desire to control and brand the organizing that they attempt to do in coalition with other communities. Um, and that is a, a very important thing that needs to happen if we're going to be successful because the historic approach to labor representation has often been to push some of those other powerful groups out into the periphery to our detriment. Um, when I think of Occupy, Black Lives Matter, 350.org, or the global trade movement you know, agenda, those were some pretty powerful things that happened around the fringes of labor, but labor joined later in the game. But there's lots to be learned from those examples, and we need to take a look and say those diversity of tactics and those diversity of approaches and diversity of issues has actually caused some of the greatest gains. Um, we also, for the first time, at least in Canada, and I suspect the same here, we've got five different generations in the workforce, five different groups, which means at least five different experiences and strategies for what to do next that need to be given um, you know, more, more head time. And just lastly, just uh, earlier this week, our uh, yoga posing uh, boxer uh, with a really nice hair, prime minister of our country, uh, passed the one year mark. And we had 400 youth activists come to an event where he was sitting down with his sleeves rolled up to talk, to engage, to dialogue. And the youth activists in the room turned their back and heckled him. And that's great. And it caused a poop storm in the House of Labor, literally with the head of the Labor Congress scolding activists for being disrespectful. Like, get over it yourself, <laughs> you know? The guy lied and people spoke up to power. That's a cool thing. So I think that's what's next. Point of clarification, it was not a literal poop storm, was it? <laughs> <laughs> Could have been. <laughs> we have time for one more question? Yeah. Thank you guys for such a great panel. Um, I actually have two questions, and so you're welcome to respond to either one, whichever kind of moves you more. Um, the first question is, I'm just wondering if you can talk about um, certainly what we've seen happening in the U.S. and in Canada, but Canada, but the proliferation of worker centers and alliances that you see happening between unions and worker centers, and where you see the where you see that kind of moving in the future, um, in particular because worker centers are more community-based organizations and, and a lot of the kind of most successful organizing campaigns right now are being done kind of at the intersection of those two organizational forms. 
The second question, and I say this as a professor who's like just constantly stunned by um, my students' lack of understanding of what a union is or why it's important or even what workers' rights are or why it matters to them, is if, if, if the folks from UE could talk about the political education that you do in the union, um, like what does that look like? What is the collective consciousness raising that you engage in? Um, you know, basically how has UE continued to be such a radical union in, the, in a broader political context where union rights are so, um, you know, devalued and, and um, kind of not even seen as important? I'll just say a couple of words about that and then let Larsine speak because I met Larsine um, in uh, 2004 and that, that was probably around the time she was coming into the union and um, I, I cannot believe who this person is today. You know, she's like absolutely my hero. The personal growth, I mean, Larsine, uh, you were not a child when I met you. Right. you. I mean, you were an adult. Yes. And just like to see this person blossom into this unbelievable kick-ass activist, like the most serious activist I've ever known um, at this stage in her life, to me that is the, if there's anything a labor union can aspire to do, it's to, it's a large scene. Because, um, you, you know, just, and it has to be because I don't mean to like proselytize, but it has to be because our union is based on the notion that the workers control the union. So if you don't have a well-educated <laughs> uh, rank and file membership, the union's gonna collapse. And our union would collapse, and it does collapse in places where there isn't a well-organized, well-educated membership, but Larsen can talk about sort of what her experience has been. Yeah, like I can say, I didn't realize that my rights were even denied me until I joined the union. And once I did and got to learn this stuff, reading stuff, it's just, I say I put my big girl drawers on and I went at it, you know. Uh, and, and I haven't stopped, you know, UE is just, they just, it don't get no better to me than UE. I'm, I'm so glad that I joined, that, you know, that, that they, they, they come and I joined. I've never been one to shy away from things, but they just gave me the tools just make it sharper and stuff, and and I like I say, I love a good fight. I love to argue with the boss, and you know, and she has and, a book I, here of pictures of her getting arrested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 and that come that come out out of the Moral Monday movement. Um, I was real honored in that, and I I can't explain to you how getting arrested was one thing because you know they were trying to take away my rights and stuff, but at the end of that to be honored to be on the stage with, with 80 to 100,000 people facing me, you know, speaking on labor, I will never ever forget that in my life. You know, uh, I was truly, I, I'll show you that, that picture. And you know, even when I got arrested, my, my board members, they were saying they were gonna come and uh, bring me a fingernail file, you know, so I could get out of jail. <laughs> <laughs> All that kind of stuff, you know, but uh, it's just it's just awesome to to be a part of of UE. Um, there are just so many things that UE does. I mean, I've been to a lot of a lot of stuff. You you could have told me at at what I'm 66. You couldn't you couldn't have told me 15 years ago that I would be to be going to Japan. I would go to Mexico. I had no idea all this stuff was going on, you know. But through all of this, I've met some wonderful people and realized that all over the world, people have the same common struggles. And when you come together and talk about it, you know, what you did to get out of yours and what I did to get out of mine, coming together, that solidarity, it is awesome. It's a, it's a good feeling. And I can reach out now if I had a situation going on to any of my sisters and brothers within the union, internationally, whatever. They would come in or say, you know, whatever they need to say to me to, to help me through the progress. It's just awesome. It's just awesome to be for you, E, I tell you. I tell you, they had the balls to come to the South. We were unorganized, you know, and, and make us do the right thing, try to make the, the state of North Carolina. And if we don't get rid of that governor we got, are y'all familiar with that House Bill too? Okay, you know. <laughs> 
Man, he's trying to take us back to 1940 or somewhere. I don't know where he's trying to take us at. And all the money that he's cost the state, he got to go. Anybody that votes for him now need they behind kicked. You need to suffer whatever the consequences are. But yes. I can't really speak about the worker center, although I have a number of students who have um, done internships at the various worker centers in New York City. But um, I know they've done a lot of great work at getting back uh, wages, uh, particularly for immigrant workers, and I don't know what the relationship is with unions, but I, I do believe there's a funding, such, um, some some funding that comes from central labor councils to fund some of these worker centers. Um, but um, for the second question, uh, I. Maybe the demographics or the, the history of CUNY is a bit different, but um, with the gear up to the strike, we've actually did uh, some curriculum for uh, professors to teach CUNY um, to our students, and we would talk about things like um, the history of CUNY, fr free tuition, um, the various cuts to funding over the years, as well as the labor, the working conditions of of the the professors as well as other staff at CUNY. Um, so. I think that there's a little more awareness, and um, there, some of our students are actually, a lot of them go into public service, so many of them become union members or they come from families, so that it's a bit more different. They, have, they tend to have more familiarity with unions and strikes. Um, they were young people during the CTA strike um, in 2005, and there's all sorts of strikes that are looming. There's a Verizon strike, uh, there's possibly a bus, stri bus school, school bus driver strike that just got authorized in New York City as well, so perhaps the context makes them a bit more aware. I would just add on the Workers Action Center in, in Canada are amazing uh, grassroots community-based uh, institutions that are the entry point for the equity-seeking communities, and particularly the newcomers who are disproportionately screwed by the worker. And unions have been very supportive of them in the sense of cutting the check. But the union movement needs to go further than simply cutting the check and looking at the organizing model that is used by Workers Action Center and actually lose some of its traditional organizing approaches and value these other approaches. For example, in Ontario, the Workers Action Center, Dina Ladd and Company, that crew has put uh, you know, the uh, Ontario's Employment Standards Act for a comprehensive review. It hasn't happened in 150 years in Ontario. It's happening now in large part because of WAC. But also, it's you see everywhere, button on my, uh, my backpack, the raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour is going to happen. It's happened in Alberta already. Alberta is neocon central out of our provinces in the country, and they've adopted a $15 an hour minimum wage. It's coming next across, but it's places like Workers Action Center that are very strategic. They're tapped into the communities that have power and rebellious creativity that the labor movement writ large needs to learn more from. Keep writing the checks, but change the organizational structures. Also on the, uh, the, the Worker Center School, we've uh, initiated uh, what we call the Southern Workers Assembly. It's like eight Southern states with unions and workers centers and groups and all. And we've had two face-to-face -face meetings and then six over-the-phone conferences. Been very successful, we're moving forward you know, to try to organize the South in, in that respect. And the worker centers are playing a part in that. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, before I ask you to uh, thank all the, the panelists, just want to put in a little plug for the uh, Labor Studies group of the Maxwell School, which um, I'm part of, and Cecilia and, and Gretchen and so forth, uh, and Steve. Um, and just to say that if you're interested uh, as a student or faculty or staff, in, in coming to our meetings and participating in our events, um, I re really urge you to do so. Uh, Gretchen's our contact person, but also you can contact myself and anybody who's in, on the Labor Studies group. So um, please join me in thanking uh, the, the participants, the, the, uh, the panelists. Uh, thank you so much for stimulating uh, time.